today, I want to invite each one of us, those who are present here in this church, and those who are connected to our different ways on the internet, to make a commitment with us to be present, to be part of this series that we're starting today. The series is entitled Be Ready. I want to show it to you up on the, on the screen. Be ready, be ready. And the, the whole series, and I don't know how many weeks, maybe the whole year, we will be dedicating uh, our time together every, every Saturday morning to study uh, this, this series. So I want, I want to invite you uh, to open your Bibles in, uh, in the book of or the letter, um, 1 Peter chapter 3, 15. And uh, here's where the title of the series and also the, the uh, message, the theme of, of the series comes from. And this is 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. I have it in, on the screen also to, to uh, read it with you. And this is very important for us to know so that we may understand why we're studying what we are going to study beginning today. This is what the Bible says, 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And what he says, friends, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. With meekness and fear. Always be ready. That's where the, the title of, of this series comes from. Always be ready. What is it? That Peter, the Apostle Paul, Paul uh, the Apostle Peter is, is asking us to do. To always be ready for what? To give a defense. To give a defense. To everyone who asks you a reason. Here's, a, here's the key. A reason for the hope. We are going to be studying different hopes during this series. And today we are going to start with the main one, the central one, the most essential hope that every Christian should and should have in their hearts. And that is, will be through the message and title, The Only Hope. The Only Hope. Let's pray together. Our dear Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we submit ourselves to you. Confessing our sins, acknowledging our shortcomings, but proclaiming your glory and your name and your holiness and your love. Today we pray, Father, take control of whatever it's going to take here, not only today, but in the next few weeks that we are going to spend together on this subject. We pray, Father, your blessing upon each one of us. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts and speak loud so that we may listen. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. The only hope. To begin with, I want to show you some pictures that we took on our trip that we had a um, couple, couple of years ago to Germany. To Germany. Let me show you the first one. Um, there is a, 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 a character that you will you will find very common in, the, in this country, beautiful country of Germany. And his name is Martin Luther. Martin Luther, every little city, every little town that you go in Germany, pretty much, you will find a big monument, a big statue of, of, this, of this character. Martin Luther King was a Catholic priest who um, will start our discussion, our conversation, our study for today. Martin Luther King here is the, the monument for him. Um, in the city of Eisleben. Eisleben was the city where he got all his studies, was a, a very uh, prominent city for what we call today the Reformation. The next city is the city of Erfurt. The city of Erfurt. Now, the city of Erfurt is where he was ordained as a, as a priest and uh, a very, a very frequent, uh, frequently um, uh, city that he will always come uh, to, to visit. And the next one, is the city of Worms, and you might recall, for those of you who have studied the, the uh, Reformation and, and what happened around the 1500s, you will know that Worms is the city where he was summoned, the priest, the, this humble priest was summoned to recant against those uh, proclamations that he was making at this point. Um, and then the next city is the, the city where he spent most of his life, the city of Wittenberg, Wittenberg. I'm pretty sure 
you have heard about this city. And this is a huge monument that is in the middle, in the middle of the town. So if you come to town, you, this is one of the first things that you're going to see. Martin Luther, a monument for him in the city of Wittenberg. In the city of Wittenberg, you, have, you will also find, and this is the next uh, uh, picture, you will also find this, and the picture doesn't show the, the, the size of this city. It's a just simply humongous uh, uh, building, the city church. It's called the city church, which, is, which was the church of this humble priest. Here, he, he, has, he has spent all his life as a, as a pastor, pastoring this church, it is said that more, more than 2,000 sermons were preached by this, by this priest in this church. And the next picture will show you the inside of this church. And uh, you will see different items there. But to your left, you will see a picture over the other picture where uh, I put uh, uh, an item that wasn't there anymore. And that is the pulpit where he used to preach for. It wasn't a pulpit that was in the middle. It was on the side and high up. And so he will preach from there. The, the uh, pews that you see there in that church didn't exist before Martin Luther. Thanks to Martin Luther, friends, you are sitting now instead of standing. Because before, this, before his time, the custom was to be standing at the church and during worship. And so you see that. You also see pictures in the back because they didn't, they didn't have access to books. So all the ways that they had, graphic ways they had to teach people were through drawings like that, paint, paintings like that. And so the next picture, uh, after being in Germany, we went, we made a, a short and quick stop in um, Italy. And in Italy, of course, we went to this beautiful, beautiful temple, beautiful church. And that is, does anyone know what that, that church is? St. Peter. St. Peter. I mean, this church is, is remarkably beautiful, remarkably beautiful. Every corner. Every spot, every place in this church is for you to keep your mouth open, like, all the time. It's just beautiful, beautiful, everywhere you see. Now, now one thing that you need to know is that the, this church, the building of this church, was funded mainly for what is called and what is known as the indulgences. So I want to show you a copy of that document next. And that is how that church was built, mainly. The indulgences were simply a document that the Roman Catholic Church will sell to their membership for them to be partially or fully uh, forgiven of the for the punishment of their sins. So again, they will buy this document from the church so that they may be forgiven of their sins. Also, this is, this is the doctrine, this is one of the one of the doctrines that, that shook the life of this monk. Because he, as an as a, as a educated um, theologian, he will start studying the Bible directly. He will go to the originals of the Bible and he will find out that this goes against what the Bible says. And remember, he was a faithful, humble, obedient monk. Catholic monk. But he, he found it himself with the Bible, and he's studying what the Bible said, and he had to make a decision. The next picture will show you the castle rock, the castle, sorry, the castle church. The castle church is uh, just a couple of blocks down from the city church, which was his church. The castle church is that church, and again, this is even bigger than the city church. The castle church is the same church that one morning, after spending time with the Word, he wrote the 95, what friends? Thesis. The 95 thesis. He, he, he collected all the documents of, of those 95 um, theses. And he walked down from his church to the castle church. And he nailed those 95 theses on the door of this church. I will show you the, the door now. Now this door was, the original one was consumed by fire. Um, and this is just a replica of that door. And if you zoom in that picture, you will see that in, uh, the, each one of those 95 theses are written on the door now. Each one of them. So, so he went down and the 95 theses and nailed the 95 theses. And the 95 theses is simply a document that uh, he was trying to get across all the leaders of the church 
not for them to shut down the church, but for them to reform the church. And that is how we, how we get the, the uh, term um, reformation. Reformation. When he did this, he wrote this, and the document went all over the place and came to the leaders. So the leaders didn't like that he wrote against them or against what they were teaching. He went summoned to worms to recant. But at that time, when you were called to do this, most likely your head will be lost from the body. And so, and so valiantly he went, valiantly he went to, uh, to talk to them about what he found in the, church, in the Bible. And uh, obviously he was going to die there. And so a friend of his, a king, decided to kidnap him. So he kidnapped the monk and put it in a storage castle. It's actually known as the Warburg Castle. The Warburg Castle, a beautiful castle that it simply was a storage room for this king. But if you go there, it's just, it's just big and beautiful everywhere also that you go. So where in the back, in the back part, left part of the building, there is this uh, room that I'm going to show you next. In this very room, same walls, same uh, chairs, same um, a desk in this room, in this building, he has spent 10 months of his life, 10 months, because he was, he was hidden from the ones that wanted to kill him. During, out of those 10 months, he has spent 10 weeks, young people listen to this, 10 weeks translating the New Testament from the Greek into the German language, because up till this point, uh, the Bible was only Latin, and no one, just few, few people spoke Latin. So, so Martin Luther said, people, normal people, common people should have access to the Bible. So he translated it from the Greek into German, which was the, 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 the language that they spoke, as you may understand. And so in 10, 10 weeks, the Lord was at work, don't you think? So when he translates the New Testament and he spends more time and he spends more time with the, the Pauline letters, especially, he found what we call today this doctrine that we are going to study today. And be ready, the series Be Ready has to do with the most important doctrines found in the Bible. And that's what we're going to do in the next weeks. I, I pray that the Lord will give us enough evidence, number one, to, be, to know that we're grounded on the, right, on the right grounds. And number two, that we will have enough tools to present a defense to everyone and to anyone who asks us a reason of the hope that is within us with meekness and fear. Is that a good plan, friends? So that's what we're going to do. So today, the, the doctrine that we are going to study today is entitled... The name of this doctrine is Sola Fide. Can we show it? Sola Fide. Justification by faith alone. The most essential, the most important of all the doctrines. None other doctrine has the importance that this doctrine has. So it is, it is crucial for us to know about it, to understand it, and to be ready to defend it. Why, friends? Because our lives may depend on it. And it might be sooner than one would think. You ready, friends? Okay, so it's going to be faster than what I thought. So get ready. Back all up. Justification by faith alone. So I want to compare quickly the, the gospel according to Rome and, and the gospel according to the reform which is where we get all this. They actually read, rediscovered what was already written in the Bible. So see the comparison between these two. The Gospel of Rome about justification. The Gospel of Rome teaches that a person is make just. Make just. And we will see how, the, how that make is important here, how that word make is important here. The reform on the country um, uh, shows and rediscovered that we are not make just, but declare Declare just. The other one is that the, 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 the Rome teaches that God justifies the just. Listen to this. Key words. But the reform taught 
that God justifies the wicked. The wicked, not just the just. Righteousness is infused. This is what Rome teaches. But the Bible teaches, which is what the reform uh, I've lifted and rediscovered, it, it, it teaches that justice, righteousness, is imputed, accredited, accounted. Also, Rome teaches that we are, or the sinner is partially, or the person is partially just and sinner. Whereas the reform teaches and uses this formula in Latin, this is the Latin formula that they use, is simul justus et peccator. That simply means simultaneously ju just and sinner. Now, this is not saying that you will continue being sinner, though you are justified. It simply says from that from different perspectives, you are, you are just, and from, a, from another perspective, you are also sinner. From the perspective of God, you are righteous once you're justified. And we will see more of this, simul, uh, simul justice et peccator. Peccator, actually. Also, Rome teaches that justification is sacramental. That means that it's part of the sacrament that you need to go through if you want to be saved. But the Bible and the reform discovered that justification is received by what, friends? Faith. Justification also from the side of Rome is by faith plus works. But the Bible teaches that faith is by faith alone. Sola fide. Sola fide. So, justification is, according to Rome, anthropocentric. That means it's centered on a person, in the person, by works. Whereas the reform, whereas the Bible teaches that is that justification is Christ-centric. That means by grace and grace alone. So Martin Luther came to the Bible. He studied the, the book of Romans. And he found different passages of the Bible. that, uh, uh, Specifically the, the book of Romans. That will simply rock his, his mind. Rock his life. And he didn't have another way but to stand against everyone else. I want to give you one of those passages, and I want you to reflect upon those for a second so that you may feel why the, what the, 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 the uh, humble monk also experienced. This is Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. Just, just um, a summary of it, basically. Romans 3, 21 through 31. This is what the Bible says. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Listen now, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, all this, all this was new to the monk. Through faith in Jesus Christ. Through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, you have to remember that Martin Luther belonged to one of the most strict um, uh, orders of the Catholic Church. And within that strict order, he was one of the most strict Monks among them. So, so when he reads, it's not about me doing, but it's through faith in Jesus Christ. Something happened in his heart. And the Bible continues, to all and all and on all who believe. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace, the grace of God, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Verse 25, whom God set forth as a propitiation. Another word for that is expiation. Another word for that is atonement by his blood. Through faith to demonstrate God's righteousness. Verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his, God's righteousness, that he might be the just and the justifier. Who? God. He's the just. It's his righteousness. It's not my good deeds, friends. It's not my good decisions. It's not how good I can be or how, how well behaved I could be. It's always God's righteousness. And that is what Paul emphasizes. God's righteousness. He's got his righteousness. Jesus' is righteousness. He is just. He is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
So when he read this, the monk just thought, wow, what is this? Remember that this is a trained monk. He had a way. He was trained in one way, and he came to the Bible, and he, he, he found something different. So when it comes to justification, there are only two paths to find it, to define it, to, to understand it. I'm going to put a graphic on the, on the screen for you to see one of them. Number one says that the, the, the path to righteousness begins with um, the works of the law. That's one. Once the works of the law are, uh, are started in your life, then through personal effort, finally, you add the faith of Christ. As a consequence of all these, you now can receive justification. That's the one way. So again, words of the law plus your personal effort adding the faith of Christ, the consequence is uh, we receive or you receive justification. Do you agree with that one? Now, the other one is, the other, the other way, the other path to justification is that you start from the faith of Jesus through believing in the faith of Jesus. You are justified. Bingo. So there are two ways that we are going to discover from the Bible, friends. Remember, you got to be ready to defend to defend the hope that you have in your, in, within your heart. So in order to know which, which the right way is here, we must define three terms that are found in this discussion. Number one, what justification is. Number two, faith of Christ. What is faith of Christ? And number three, what is faith? Let's start with justification. What does justification mean after all? I mean, we always hear this word justification. What is it? Well, Justification is a personal term, is a, uh, excuse me, it's a legal term. Justification is a legal term used in courts of law. It deals with the verdict of a judge pronounces when a person is declared innocent, innocent of the charges brought against him or her. Justification is the opposite of condemnation. You will see this also comparing Romans chapter 5. Verse 1 with Romans chapter 8, verse 1. So again, justification is the opposite of condemnation. Additionally, because the words just and righteous come from the same Greek word, for a person to, to be justified means that the person also is counted as righteous. So when you are pronounced when you are pronounced righteous, when you are pronounced justified, when you are pronounced just, it's not because of what you've done. So what, is, what does justification mean then? Okay, so justification involves more than simply pardon or forgiveness. Right? It's not like God sees you and He knows what you've done. He knows who you are. He knows what you have done when no one else has seen you. And says, okay, I forgive you what you did. It's not just that. It goes beyond that. Because it is the positive declaration, the divine declaration that a person is righteous. That a Levi is righteous. That John is righteous, that Leon is righteous, and even worse, that Rudy is righteous. Justification. So Paul also tells us who, who is to be justified. Who needs justification? Who needs this? He says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 15, and also in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, Galatians uh, 2 15 and Ephesians 2 12. He says, I don't have those on the screen yet, but he says in Galatians 2.15, that's what I'm giving it to you, Ephesians 2.12, he says that the ones that need justification are the sinful Gentiles. Is he suggesting that the Hebrews, the, the Jews are fine, they don't need that? He's not saying that because Paul also says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, you know what he says, right? Romans 3.23, he says, for all have sinned. 
and, fall, and fall short of the glory of God. So here is the question again. Who needs justification? Everyone who has ever sinned, both Jews and Gentiles. Everyone. Not just the Gentiles. Not, not just the people that are in the, in, pris in the prisons. Not only the people that are outside the churches. Everyone needs justification because all of us have come short of the glory of God. So that's why we need justification. To be justified not because of what we've done, but because of what He has done. Praise God. So that's what justification is. And I hope it's a little... It's a little clear in your minds. But how about the faith of Jesus? Is the other term that we need to define. The faith of Jesus. What does that mean? The faith of Christ. And what is the relationship between that faith of Christ and justification, with, which is what we study today? For that, I want to take you to the Bible again in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Galatians chapter six, uh, 2 and verse 16. But this, excuse me, the verse that I'm going to read today now is actually... From a different translation of the Bible. And the reason why I'm going to use this Syrian translation. Is because this translation gives the emphasis that we need to get. When it, to get when it comes to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. In the context of justification. Again, the faith of Christ is what we're trying to define here. Listen to what the Bible says. Therefore, we know that a man is not justified from the works of the law. But by the faith of Jesus, the Messiah. And we believe in Him, in Jesus the Messiah. Listen to the emphasis. That from His faith, that of the Messiah is not yours. We might be justified and not from the works of the law. Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's all with Jesus. That's what the faith of Jesus is. The faith of Jesus is the faith of Jesus. It's not my faith. It might, friends, it might seem odd to us, but our faith doesn't justify us. Because if it were my faith, then I have something to boast about. So it's not my faith. It's the faith of Jesus. Again, friends, we are, you and I, we are justified before God by the faith of Christ. What does that mean? By the faithfulness Jesus showed in his life. Free of sin and in his undeserved death. The faith of Jesus. So what is the place of faith here then? What is faith for? Because we did see in the path that we saw in the graphic. That my faith has something to do here. What is, what is then faith in relation to the faith of Jesus? Let me put it in, in simple words. Faith is an act of willingness by which we make Jesus' expiatory sacrifice ours for the forgiveness of our sins. And we accept being justified by the sinless life that Jesus lived in our place. That's what faith is. All that I do is I accept the faith of Jesus. I accept what Jesus has done for me. His faith I receive. And because of that, what he has done is imputed, accredited, accounted as if he were me. What a God, friends. Why will he do that? Why will he go through the mess of dealing with me? Why? Simple but profound answer. Love. Love. So what, which, which path is it? Let's put the graphic up again. Of course, it doesn't have to do with the works of the law or my, my personal efforts or adding the faith of Jesus. No, 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 no. Simply, simply. Is the faith of Jesus. That's how I get justified. And yes, I believe in that faith of Jesus. I by faith, I receive that faith. I accept that faith of Jesus. And because I have allowed that faith of Jesus to be credited 
to be deposited in my bank account, then I am justified. That's why Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16, again, I'm going to read it from uh, New King James Version. I read it before from the Syrian translation. This is New King James Version. Knowing that a, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by, work, by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Why is this so important, justification? Why, why, why is this so important, friends? Because sin, our sins, our lives separate us, separate, separated us from our God. And the moment we get separated from Him, we are going away from life. And if you go away from life, you're dead. You're dead. You might be breathing. You might be walking. You might be able to speak. But you're dead. The moment you go away, the moment I go away from God... I die. But not to panic. Because God had a solution. He sent, God sent His Son. He sent Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus Christ came to save us from our own sins. Jesus is the solution for the problems that I got myself into. And that's why John contributes to these, these justification by faith alone doctrine. By saying, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and this is first john 3 not, 3 4 whoever commits sin also commits law, lawlessness and sin is lawlessness so i broke the law of god and because of that i'm guilty period i am guilty but regardless of my guilt i'm found innocent in the court of heaven why? Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Because Jesus was sent to reconcile us back to the Father. How does that reconciliation happen? By faith. By faith. Again, Galatians 2.16 says, um, A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Friend, friend, you need to understand that through faith we come near to Jesus, to His purity, to His transforming power. But when we come near, the purity of Jesus is credited to the sinner. The moment we accept Jesus, the moment we uh, receive Jesus, His purity, listen, listen to this. His purity becomes our beauty. Sam, are you pure? Christy, are, are you pure? If you ask me that question, I would say without thinking, without even a second thinking, I would say no. But the reality is that the moment God says, you are pure, I am pure. And this is what, again, Paul for, uh, uh, the monk Martin Luther found this in Romans chapter 4 verses 22 through, through 25. Listen to what the Bible says. And therefore it was accounted, talking about Abraham, it was accounted to him for righteousness. It shall be imputed, accounted, credited to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification see friends jesus brings reconciliation to us and that's why he's also called the prince of peace because before jesus we were at war with his father it required the son of god to come to this world to live the spotless life that he lived to go to calvary to die on the cross to resurrect and to ascend for us to have a chance to be at peace with His Father. 
And this was found also in Romans chapter 5 and verses 8 through 10. And the Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love. This is not Jesus' plan only. The Father is involved in all this. Because the Father loves you, friend. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, through Jesus. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, the cross, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Can I be saved without justification? The answer is no. The answer is no. So that's how, how much essential this doctrine is. Because the purity of God, the pureness of God can only, be, uh, can only receive purity as well. So if you plan to be before the God of the universe, you need to be declared pure. How does that happen? Jesus. Jesus. Look what Romans 3 uh, verses 24 through 26 says. This is another one. I'm showing to you the passages that rocked the life of this monk. Being justified freely by his grace, the Bible says, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Because in his forbearance, uh, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. That he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So that's how the name of the child given to the world becomes so uh, important peace prince of peace prince of peace because when we come to Jesus we have an encounter with peace because when we receive Jesus we make peace with God that's what Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says uh, therefore having been justified by faith we have what friends peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, all these verses, all this, this uh, theology is simply summarized in three steps. Let me give it to you. Simple. Three steps. We want to call it today the three steps of salvation. This is what takes place for you, for me to be saved. Listen to these, friends. This is very important. Come back. Number one. By the sacrifice of Jesus, a Christian, you and I, is saved of the consequences of sin. How are you saved from the consequences of sin? By the sacrifice of Jesus. The cross. Number two. Step number two of salvation. Number two. By the dwelling of Jesus, a Christian is saved from the power of sin. How are we saved from the power of sin? Because Jesus lives in me. And number three. By Jesus destroying sin, a Christian, listen, will be saved from the presence of sin. Do you understand those three steps? Maybe not, so I'm going to show you in a different way. Three steps of salvation, different way. Friends, at the cross, at the cross, you are saved of the consequence of sin. In your daily lives, walking with the same one that you accepted at the cross, walking with the same one that you accept as sacrifice of, on your daily lives, in your daily lives, you are saved from the power of sin. Sin doesn't have power over you. Why? Because there is a more powerful being that dwells within you. And finally, at the second coming. When, friends? Second coming. And we are going to study that doctrine. You don't want to miss it. At the second coming, you will be saved from the presence of sin. Because at the second coming, sin will be destroyed. And it will not have 
It will not have, will be flying around you anymore. And that's how we are justified. And that's how we are declared justified. In a moment. In an instant. You confess Jesus. You accept Jesus. Jesus imputes his righteousness. His righteousness. Not your deeds. Not what you do. Or don't do. He imputes his righteousness. He accredits his righteousness. He accounts his righteousness on you. And in that moment you are declared just. Righteous. Justify all praises to our God. But somebody might ask, how about obedience? Because you seem to be saying that it's all about God. You don't have to do anything. How about obedience? It's a good question. It's a fair question. Listen, friends. Obedience, and this is what the Bible says, is the fruit of the believer's faith. Do you hear Obedience is the fruit of the believer's faith. Because of this fruit, disobedience is stopped. And it doesn't have to do anything with the Christian in the Christian life. So let me take you back to the graphic on the path to justification. We already know that the first one is not biblical. But the second one says, starting from the faith of Jesus, going through the faith, believing in the faith of Jesus, we receive justification but once we are justified listen friends once we are justified we live a life of obedience to God that's what we do is the result we are not obedient to God to be saved we are obedient to God because we are saved we are not obedient to God to be justified We are obedient to God because we are justified. So obedience is the fruit of faith. That's why, that's why uh, again, Paul says in Romans 3, 31, he says, Do we then make void? This is the end of the same, of the same discourse that he's been, he's been um, sharing with us. Do we then make void the law through faith? And this is what categorically he says. Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. How do we establish the law? Jesus living in me. How do we establish the law? Me being justified by faith alone. The faith of Jesus. And that's how Martin Luther came to the greatest of all the mottos found in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11. The just, does anyone know it? Shall live by faith. That's how we live. That's how we make decisions. That's how we know whether we go right or left. We live by faith. Who does live by faith? The just. So what is it that you have to experience first? Justification. Once you are justified, you declare just, righteous. And from that moment on, you walk by faith. And friends, true faith produces what? Obedience. And this is what James says in James chapter 2 and verse 20. He says, but do, do you, do you want to, uh, oh, okay, okay. But do you want to know, there you go, all foolish men, the faith without works is dead. Because works is the consequence Of that justification that God has done in us. Is the result. Not because we want to be saved. But because we are saved. So listen friends. Accepting God's forgiveness. Is the root. Living Jesus' holiness. Is the fruit. Of salvation. Can I say that again? Accepting God's forgiveness. Is the root. Living Jesus' holiness. Is the fruit of, of salvation. So choose holiness. Choose holiness. Because this holiness is not something that we produce. It's something that Jesus imparts and imputes in us. Praise God. And that's why Romans 6, 19 says, 
I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. In other words, Paul is saying, in the same way that you were so good to do bad, now be so good doing good. Present your bodies. Then allow the Holy Spirit to do the work that He wants to do in you, through you, by you. So that's how Jesus appeals then. This is the appeal of Jesus through Paul again. Remember that all these passages rocked the life of the monk. And this is 1 Timothy 6.12. And I'm going to end with this. 1 Timothy 6.12. This is Jesus' appeal through the Apostle Paul. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Jesus calls you. Jesus invites you. Jesus appeals to you, to me, to be justified. He appeals to you and to me to come to hear to Him, the just and the justifier, so by faith we can be declared righteous. And if it were for my deeds, if it were for my acts, if it were for who I am, unrighteousness is what I deserve. To be clear, unrighteous is what I deserve. But God in His love, but God in His mercy, but God in His everlasting grace, when He sees me, He sees Jesus. The Father sees Jesus. And friends, there is nothing wrong with Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, all he sees is righteousness in the most pure or purest version of it. Come to me and be justified. I want to prepare you for eternity. But you need to be declared first just and I have this for you that's God's invitation friend and once you are justified go ahead and live by faith the faith that will keep you walking and connected with the source of righteousness may the Lord bless us and may he continue pumping the blood the divine blood that we need to have in our bodies so that we may glorify His name in everything we do. God bless you, friends, and keep walking towards eternity. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we praise your name for giving us your Bible. And we do believe in sola scriptura. We do believe that this book is your book. We do believe that this book is your truth. And that is why we are going to dedicate weeks to study the most important um, doctrines found in this book. And for this series, we want to call them hope. And today, Father, this the most essential one. The fact that it's Jesus who does it all. It's Jesus who has done it all. And it's Jesus who is about to bring this to a completion so much that I may be able to receive that title, Righteous. Father, no matter how much we study, it's just impossible for us to understand the kind of love that drives you to share your righteousness with wicked people like us. But Father, though we do not understand completely, we know 
That is one of the greatest reasons for us to praise your name. And that's what we want to do today, tomorrow, and the day after. We want to praise your name with our lives. And we are going to continue fighting the good fight, even if it looks difficult. We surrender our lives to you. And we pray, Father, that you will do as you please with each one of us. Bless us with Jesus. Bless us with your spirit. And help us to keep on walking until we walk together in eternity. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the Prince of Peace. Thank you for the Justifier. Thank you for the sacrifice, the atonement. The one that came to live, to die, to resurrect, ascend, and is coming soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. God bless you, everyone. See you next week.